family. Good morning, church family. Can you hear me now? Change me and change each one of us from glory to glory. We thank you, Father, for hearing and answering us and blessing us as we meet with you here this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. This weekend, we're celebrating, the world celebrates Easter. And we have a communion feast here this morning. But Jesus had a passion. What was his passion for? You know, we, we like to think, he went to the cross and he died for me. I want to show you something in Scripture. First, I want to share with you that here's a quote that I found on a campus or a poster. Vision. Without a task is only a dream. A task with a vision, excuse me, a task without a vision is but drudgery. But a vision with a task can change the world. Amen. And what I'm getting at is that Jesus when he came here, as soon as there was sin, there was a Savior. Amen. And that Savior had a plan. And we need to see that plan more clearly every day. We need to experience every day an opportunity to have Jesus to be our Savior. You know? Past week, I mean, no, it was the week before that. True revival. I'm going through this little book. Yes, sir. True revival. Speak into it loud or close. True revival. What is true revival? We went through it. We're going through with it at, at work. I'm using this devotion. And every day, we go through a little section. This one. Hello? Okay, you hear me? Gave me this. 
And I took this idea and I went to Dr. Cologne in the theology department. I knew it was right. I just, just wanted to get his okay on it. And I said, before the fall, the law, before the fall, looked like this. The Ten Commandments. You see that that was the law, and Adam and Eve had it written on their hearts. It was there. As soon as they fell, this is the law. In of ourselves, we cannot keep the Ten Commandments, but if we put our path in the foot that God has ordained through Jesus, that pathway, the sanctuary, this was the law. It is still the law today, and you've got to understand this. And I want you to really contemplate on this. When you go home, pull this out and study it out, and you'll see it. This is the law. It's the only way we will make it. It's the only way. And you know what? Jesus, well, let's put it this way. In his ministry, he had such a passion for people, but he wanted us to understand that without him, we can do nothing. Amen. We cannot keep the law in our own strength. But this is the pathway. Now, let me go with you over one of our devotional talks. Faith is more than talk. How to be a born-again Christian. The faith that is unto salvation is not a casual faith. It is not the mere consent of the intellect. It is belief rooted in the heart that embraces Christ as a personal Savior, assured that He can save to the uttermost all that come unto Him. To believe that He will save others but will not save you is not genuine faith. And you know, I've experienced that. So have you. You can see other people you think are better than you, and you say they have a better chance at it. That's not faith, and that's not genuine faith. <clears throat> he will save others, but he will not save you is not genuine, genuine faith. But when the soul lays hold upon Christ as the only hope of salvation, then genuine faith is manifested. This faith leads its prophet. Processor to place all the affections of the soul upon Christ. His understanding is under the control of the Holy Spirit, and his character is molded after the divine likeness. His faith is not a dead faith, but a faith that works by love, and leads him to behold the beauty of Christ, and to become assimilated to the divine character. The whole work is the Lord's from beginning to end. The perishing sinner may say, I am a lost sinner. But Christ came to seek and to save that which was lost. I came not after the righteous, but after sinners to repentance. I am a sinner, and he died on Calvary's cross to save me. And I need not remain a moment longer unsaved. He died and rose again for my justification. And he will save me now. Amen. I accept that forgiveness. He has promised. That has to be our experience. Now, open your Bibles with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 6. Oh, excuse me. 2 Corinthians. And I'm going to read from verse 14 to 7-1, because in here lies the gospel. 
And here lies the gospel. And I want you to get this. Do not be unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For in what fellowship has righteousness with lawlessness? And what communion has light with darkness? And what accord has Christ with Baal? Or what part has a believer with an unbeliever? And that agreement has, and what agreement has the temple of God with idols? For you are the temple of the living God. Amen. And God has said, I will dwell in them, I will walk, walk among them, I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Amen. Come out from among them, and be ye separate, says the Lord. Do not touch what is unclean, and I will receive you, and I will be a father unto you, and you shall be my sons and daughters, Amen. says the Lord of hosts. Therefore, having these promises, beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness, of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. See, we're going on. This is a journey. It says in here in verse 14, we are, do not be unequally yoked with unbelievers. What does that really mean? I'll tell you one thing it means. I'm different. And so are you. We are different. And he says, don't be contaminated. And he says, not so much with other people that are unbelievers, but the practices that they do. Amen. I mean, we wander after the world. I mean, you know, if we look at it, how many things for us, we are so distracted. And you know Jesus, when he came here, he had a passion. You know what it was for? When he walked this earth, the first thing he did is public ministry. When he got right up there, cleansed the temple. And did he not do that at the end of his ministry? And did he not say on that triumphal entry, Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem. Oh, would I not gather you as a mother hen to her chicks and protected you? But you would not have me. Therefore, your house is left to you desolate. If you and I in that path, we become that house. And we can get His protection. And that Holy Spirit will guide you from sin unto righteousness, sin unto righteousness, sin unto righteousness, glory to glory, all through your sojourns here on this earth. As we go through here, you are different. We are not consumed by the football games. We're not consumed by all the distractions the world has to offer. And you know, we distract ourselves to death. And we don't see who we really are in Christ Jesus. He's a Savior with a plan. And His plan is in the sanctuary. And you know, as we go through this, what agreement has the temple of God with idols? For you are that temple of God, the living God. I will dwell in them. And that's what the Jews had the privilege. The sanctuary was set up, and they surrounded it. They camped all around it. In a way, they were protecting it. It was their treasure to watch over and protect it. If they only knew what they had. And you know what? When Babylon came and destroyed the city, they were taken into captivity. And what did Daniel do? What did Daniel do? Three times a day. The temple was destroyed, tore down. What did Daniel do? Three times a day. He opened up this door, the window, and he prayed at it, even on the pains of his death. He knew the decree that anyone worship another god other than the king. They would be put to death, thrown in the lion's den. And yet, he knew where his salvation came from. He knew the plan, and he prayed there. And God promised he would restore it. You know, we're coming up on a new quarterly. I have it. And I want to challenge you. Friends, come to Sabbath school class. 
Because I want to challenge you something right here this morning. Look at this. The name of it is Major Lessons from Minor Problems. And I haven't checked this out, but I'm going to tell you something. After Jerusalem was destroyed, these prophets come on the scene, and what are they doing? They're trying to strengthen and encourage the brother, the church, that's gone in captivity. Everything's destroyed. But they keep talking about it will be restored. It will be restored. As you go through the minor prophets, I'm just going to tell you, each time we read one, go to the lesson, and I'm going to tell you something you're going to find in Scripture. I haven't checked it all out. Prove me wrong. <clears throat> Prove me wrong. Each one will going to say something about the temple, the house of God. Each one will say that. And you know what? When Jesus divorced the children of Israel because they did not know what they had in their possession, we come to the last days of this earth's history. Judgment began in 1844. The only thing that gives us the qualifications to be a doc, uh, to be a denomination is we have to have a unique doctrine that sets us apart from the Christian church at large. Everything we have, all our doctrines, the Sabbath comes from the Seventh-day Baptist. All our doctrines. The only unique one we have is the sanctuary message. And yet we're not studying it. We don't know it. And you know what? Scripture tells me, my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. We need to study this and understand it. I'm going to share with you something here. You know, at uh, Garden of Prayer, Brother got up and said, did you have a tough week? You know, I hate to lose at anything. And <coughs> I've, I've moved here to Maryland, and I had to get my car registered to the Motor Vehicle Administration. It took me three times to go there. Three times it kept sending me back. And I finally got my car registered. Then I had to go get a driver's license. I went the first time. I had to take the eye test put me down there and says, okay, read from left to right. And I'm looking in there for this eye test. And I start reading it. No, you missed it. You, you missed it. You, there's one before that. And I try it again. Didn't work. She says, there's six on one side and six on the other side. I said, no, there's not. There's four. There's only four on one side, four on the other side. And she brought in somebody else. They looked in there. No, there's six. I said, I'm only seeing four. I gathered up my papers and walked out there. Oh, man. He said, I got to get an eye test. Now I'm worried about this. I said, oh, man, I'm going to have to wear glasses. And so G. Marie set us up. Cooper. Dr. Ruby Cooper. What was the first name? Dr. Ruby Cooper. Who? Dr. Ruby Cooper. Okay, Dr. Cooper. I didn't hear the first one. Ruby, Ruby, Ruby Cooper. Joe and Carol's ophthalmologist. So we we go there, and Jean Marie and I, she's getting her eye tested too. And you know what? It's a passion to me that our people understand the sexual message. And she's an Adventist. And so I'm trying to talk to her and her husband, the small church, they're disbanding. Uh, they're looking for some place to find, go to a church. So here I am, and I'm thinking, oh, if they only knew this message. And I start sharing with them a little bit. And um, I'm looking for opportunities, any place I can, to share this message. And so we have to go out there. She leaves, and we're looking for eyeglasses. And she also told me, she says, you know, about that little machine that you look into, if it's not adjusted right, you can only see four. I've had other people come and complain about that. It's not adjusted right. And Jean Marie told me from the beginning, she said, don't get upset. She said, maybe God has a plan in all this. She always tells me that. But things don't go right. God has a plan. He'll make something good come out of this. So 
We're out there trying on all these glasses and everything. I've got a lady waiting on me. G. Marie's got a lady waiting on her. And the place closes at 7 o'clock. Well, it's past 7. Matter of fact, we didn't walk out of that until 8 o'clock. And, and I was wondering, I'm looking at these two ladies, one worked with me, one worked with G. Marie, and I said, I know they're not Adventists, but I wonder if they know enough that I can share the sanctuary message with them. And I do this all the time. And friends, you'd be surprised. You can do the same thing. And what I did, I said, they started talking about uh, somehow Seventh-day Adventists and this and that. I said, you want to make us unique? What qualifies us as a denomination? I said, we have a unique doctor called the sanctuary message. I said, you got a piece of paper? Let me draw you a picture. That's all it takes. Draw a picture. This simple. This simple. And you can share the gospel. The full gospel. Today, so excuse me, tomorrow, Easter Sunday, most people will only hear a part of a gospel. The cross. Jesus died and rising again. Well, what happened after that? He became a high priest. And here it is. I, I shared with this. This is a nine foot high wall of linen. White, bright, clean linen. This represents the robe of righteousness Adam and Eve lost when they sinned. And this is the path to get that robe of righteousness again. And at this point right now, this represents Christ's righteousness covering my faulty character. And as I go through this, you come into the gate. This is called the gate down here. This is called the door into the holy place. And this is the veil holy place. And I just shared with them the gate, the door, and the veil. You know what colors they are? Blue, purple, scarlet. Blue. Royalty to God's law. Every Jew wore a blue hem around his arms and around his robe. Signifying he was walking in the law of God. Everything he did was according to the law of God. It was a reminder. Blue. Loyalty to God's law. Purple. As I go through this process, I become a son, a daughter of the king of the universe who created all this. Scarlet, sacrifice. Just as Jesus was God's gift for mankind, that he gave his life that I might have eternal life. I said, we are called to sacrifice. As we go through this promise, or as we go through this process, the Holy Spirit gives you a gift. <clears throat> And every believer should know his gift and use it for the honor and glory of God. Amen. And you know what Satan has got us? He has got us. Oh, well, let me finish this and I'm going to tell you how Satan has got us. You go through here. As you first come here, the brazen altar. This represents the lamb, sacrifice. This is the cross, represents the cross, the lamb who sacrificed. Behold, John says, behold the lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. All the sins were put upon him at the cross. This represents the cross. We come here, and as people can see, you are moved by the presentation of the gospel. And then you come, you study at home. You're studying more. You come to the meetings. You hear more and more. And you come to a place where you make your commitment to labor and water, which represents I make my commitment. I'm dying to this world. And I rise up anew, afresh, to live for Christ and His kingdom. Now, this right here is the outward. Anybody can see my movements out here and see. We're going to see just how far He'll go with this, this gospel thing. And people are watching you because they're watching me. But you know this represents the courtyard. This represents the courtyard. This represents Jesus walking on earth. The courtyard here is the earth. You know, we read the Psalms 100 this morning. I read it. I read it every time I preach. Go home and read it. Come into his courts with thanksgiving. Come into his gates with thanksgiving. Into his courts with praise. That's what it says. That's my duty. Every time I get up in the morning, no matter how bad a day I have, praise God. I have an opportunity to serve the king of the universe. I have another opportunity to become more firmly set my foot in that path and become a son of God for eternity. 
This is the plan of salvation. We need to know and understand this. In here, this is the outward acts of the saints. Anybody can see. But in here, it's the holy place. Nobody can see in there. Nobody can see into your holy place. What is your holy place? In your body temple? It's your mind. It's your mind. And look what should be consumed in our minds. Don't be entertained by the way of the world. Don't touch the unclean thing. Everything that is unclean defiles your mind. It defiles you. You drink that drink of alcohol. It distorts your ability to reason for righteousness. In here, as Jesus was, so should we. The Holy Spirit enlightens us to the face bread, which represents the Word of God, which brings us to the place where, as I'm reading, Nobody needs to see, as I'm reading God's Word, nobody needs to see what goes on in here. I can read and come under conviction and then pray at the mercy seat. Here we have such a high at the mercy seat that we can come in time of need and ask for mercy because I've sinned and get grace, power to overcome <clears throat> that Satan puts before me. We need grace. Did Jesus need grace? Did he need grace? He said every day he prayed for his grace from his heavenly father to overcome. He came just like you and me and overcame and he shows that this is the way walking in it. Thy way, O Lord, is in the sanctuary. This is where we need to go. As we go in here, we see that sin that so easily besets us. And we come to the mercy seat. I just learned promises. To overcome every deception that Satan has for me. And I learn the truth. And I come here and I pray. And you know what you do when you do that? When you pray there, you cut off an avenue. You say, God, forgive me in this. I did not know of this. But now, Father, I see the truth. But you know how weak I am. Give me the strength to overcome. And you know what you've done? The axe is laid at the root. That axe is Jesus. And it cuts that sin out of your life. And you just cut off the path that Satan would get to you. And you have now an opportunity to influence others for Jesus. This is the way, walking in it. And you know, this is something we need to do on a daily basis. This is the passion that Jesus had. Now, I'm going to go back here. For you are the temple of the living God. I dwell, I will dwell in them and walk among them, and I will be their God. Therefore, come out from among them. Be ye separate, says the Lord of hosts. Do not touch what is unclean, and I will receive you. I will be a father to you, and you shall be my sons and daughters, says the Lord Almighty. That's what I want to be, don't you? We want to get this victory. And and here's here's how we it was. In of myself, the first work we all have to do is repentance. But it's not my work. Repentance is a gift from God. Do you not know the goodness of God causes us to repent? And God will give you repentance. And you know what repentance is? You're walking one direction, you turn around and walk this direction. This is what we need. And it says, as a father to a son, do you realize?